Hi, everyone. I'm Steph. I'm Lisa. And together we're PD, PD Connect. Connect. Thanks for joining us today. Lisa's going to read the bio. Thanks for joining us for our first Monday of the month speaker series. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Dr. Michael Jakovich, PhD, and who is an associate professor at the Department of Neurology at uh, the University of Southern California. He has an extensive educational background, including um, education at University of Toronto, the University of California Davis, a PhD in molecular biology at US, USC, and a postdoc at Yale. Anyway, it goes on. There's this... He's very smart. <laughs> He's very smart. And we are <laughs> very lucky to be here. But in 1995, he joined Dr. Bill Langston at the Parkinson's Institute in Sunnyvale, which is over where we are in the Bay Area, as a research scientist. And in 1999, he moved to USC and has been there ever since. And the primary focus of the research that he does is to better understand the underlying mechanism of neuroplasticity in models of neurodegenerative disease disorders and addiction. So we love that, it's so important, and we want you to understand what's happening when we're trying to teach you about neuro neuroplasticity, but Dr. Mike is going to do that for us. So thank you so much for Thanks being for here. for being here, yes, we're very excited. No, thanks, Lisa and Steph. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I hope everybody can hear me. Everybody's plugged in. Good. Excellent. Um, so let me just say, uh, this is kind of like a discussion. I don't think uh, I want to just sit and throw a bunch of data at you to show that we're doing you know, work. I actually want this to be beneficial to you. I want you to come away, hopefully, with something that's useful in your life. Um, two things here, the balance is that I've got, you know, guidelines, information, tell you why to do things, but also we have a lot of evidence-based medicine behind it. We do the work. Um, and when we started this work back in, you know, the mid nineties, trying to understand how the brain changes in response to uh, experience, uh, there was never anything, uh, there was no, you never heard of a uh, Parkinson patients that ever exercised, exercise, physical therapy, uh, we're not part of the regimen at all. I mean, it was probably unlikely you'd ever find a Parkinson's patient that exercised, except maybe one that was running away from their spouse, but that was about it. And uh, now it's a standard of care. And uh, every single patient with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer's, with mild cognitive impairment, with uh, any type of brain disorder, exercise is actually part of the, uh, of the, of the standard of care now. And uh, we're continuing to try to figure out why that is. And then can we make, can make it better? Can we improve it? And I'll try to give you some data to give you some very specific aspects of, of, of exercise. And um, I'm, I'm you know, a fairly humble person, but I've been told that much of the change in the whole paradigm of understanding exercise in Parkinson's really comes from our lab. And uh, as part of this army of people that have been working in this field, um, so we're pretty proud of that. And, uh, and uh, so we've really, really worked very hard to try to apply this. And we do everything in the lab from cell cultures to animal models, to imaging humans, to community care, to everything. I mean, we do the whole spe spectrum. We have a translational program here. I'm just one of several people. I kind of lead the program with uh, Dr. Petzinger, Giselle Petzinger, I think, may have spoken to you guys in the last year or so. I, I think, yes, okay, that's right. And Adam Lundquist is another person that may have spoken. He came from our lab and uh, was a, a stellar grad student with us. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about Parkinson's and people and lifestyle. And I'll talk to today about some of our work on, on physical activity and exercise and give you some take home lessons. I'll throw in a little bit of, of diet in here. Diet's becoming another important aspect. And, those of you who attend national neurological meetings will remember about four years ago at the end of the Alzheimer's disease meeting in, I think it was actually in Los Angeles, and they had a panel of experts come up and they were very excited about the new major breakthroughs in Alzheimer's disease. And the number one breakthrough in Alzheimer's disease that year was exercise. And uh, we're like, yeah, <laughs> we know this. Um, but it's now becoming something that's transcending into, into a lot of other fields. And so it's becoming uh, you know, some, something that's, that applies to everything. And it's not just applies to people 
with uh, disorders like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment. It's a lifestyle thing. And uh, in my classes that I teach as an under, you know, under, in undergrads, I emphasize lifestyle. And lifestyle is probably the number one drug that we have that combats disease. We believe, and the evidence indicates that it modifies disease progression. Uh, we have patients, or Giselle has patients, that are in their third decade of Parkinson's, and they're not using walkers, so, but they exercise daily. And I think that's a very optimistic perspective on, on why we exercise and why we stay active. And uh, these become very, very important. And, and our work in the lab is really to try to figure out what are the underlying mechanisms? What, what's going on in your brain? And then how can we improve that? And maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, modify disease progression better. We're not curing the disease. If someone tells you this cures the disease, um, you know, they're basically the back end of a bull. And, uh, and I, it's, that's not what's happening here. We haven't stopped disease progression yet. Uh, we change disease progression, and certainly we can impact how patients deal with the disease, drugs, and all these types of things. And like I said, uh, patients are living multiple decades with these disorders and these challenges. And so we're just trying to to see if we can we can we can share some of that with you. So I'll I'll give you a little bit of data, and I'll you know try to share with you why why we're useful you know, why we do something worthwhile, you know, in the lab and can give us some great insight into the disease. And I'll kind of give you a little bit of a historical perspective of where we've been for the last, I guess it's almost 25 years of thinking about this, uh, these particular problems. And if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, I'll leave it up to Lisa and Steph, just stop me, okay? So I can come up for air, take a breath. If you see any question that could be, put your hand up or wave or just shout or put it in the chat, I don't care. I'm, 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 a, I'm, you know, we're all colleagues and friends here. I, uh, there's no hierarchy of anything. So uh, this is just, uh, we're, we're friends who are trying to uh, go through life in a, in a, in a good way. So, um, and, and inform you as best I can. Um, I can send up some articles later to, um, um, to, to Lisa and Stephanie, they can share those. Uh, we're trying to write some things uh, at uh, all different levels, not just for the scientific community, but also we've written some things for um, intelligent lay people, which are you guys, and uh, you guys are all intelligent lay people, and uh, so uh, so we're trying to, to to share those with you too, and, and do do some other things. So so let me just do a uh, share screen if uh, Lisa can give me the power to do that, and uh, I can put up my 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 uh, PowerPoint, and let's see. Every time I do this, it's always new buttons to push. You are screen sharing. Okay, so something's happening. And uh, make sure I'm also not muted. I have given a lecture and like 40 minutes into a lecture, one of my students says, do you, do you know that you were muted? And I'm going, thanks guys. So, <laughs> but- You can uh, maximize your screen. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to do awesome. my, this Great. thing. There's another button. Awesome. How's that? Thank perfect. you. Okay. All right, guys. So I. I, I, de I depend on Lisa and Stephanie to keep me in line here. And if there's a problem, uh, shout out. So, okay. So I really want to talk, I'll, I'll throw in a little bit of that diet because I, I, we're starting to get into that field and it turns out that it's, a, it's also something very interesting, but I'll focus really on exercise and, and the underlying mechanisms and kind of give you a feel for why exercise works. And then to really answer a couple of questions, and the questions I think patients always have is what type of exercise should I do and how long should I do it? Well, that's what I'm going to try to tell you. And I'm going to tell you how long you should exercise. And just to let you know, it's about 150 minutes a week. And should it be intense? Yes, it should be intense. And, and uh, what does intense mean? Before you, some of you fall asleep, intense means that you are exercising at a level where it's a little bit difficult for you to, to, to talk. So you kind of use the talking thing. So if you're with somebody, this is why when you exercise, you exercise in a group. And if nobody's talking, that means you guys are exercising pretty vigorously. If someone is yapping away and telling you all about their new recipes and the new Netflix, and then they're, all the, they're not working out hard enough. Okay, you gotta tell them, pick it up guys. You gotta, you gotta start exercising. So we try to get to the point where we know it's moderate because you can say a few words. Okay, you're walking along, or you're exercising, and okay, let me so. So I'm watching this really new series. It's on every Thursday night. I'm, 
and I, and I think it's going to be really good, that's moderate exercise. Okay. Uh, you should also be breaking a sweat. And so you can just feel yourself. I'm sweating a little bit. And those are our kind of our, you don't need a $200, a $500, a $900 Garmin anymore to tell you that you have moderate exercise. Okay. You can just judge it by that. How long you should you do that? We have a magic number right now that's kind of immersed from our emerged from our work, and this is called 150 minutes, and 150 minutes per week. So that works about to be about 30 minutes a day. And the other thing that's important, okay, so I've told you that you got to break a sweat, so it's got to be pretty rigor, moderate to vigorous at level of intensity. It's got to be about 150 minutes, and also you don't have to do it all at once. OK, you don't have to say, well, I can't exercise today because I don't have 30 minutes. No, no, no. You can do it in what we call bouts. And a bout is a piece. And it's a piece of time. And this piece of time can be anywhere from two to five to 10 minutes. So going up the stairs at the parking structure, ah, that's three minutes of vigorous exercise. Um, chasing after your, your, your dog that you dropped a leash in, in the park and took you five minutes. Ah, that's moderate to vigorous exercise. And that's a, a bout that's actually sufficient. Uh, maybe uh, uh, walking rather vigorously towards that stop sign on my way to the, uh, I wouldn't say liquor store, but let's just say off to the boba store. Um, absolutely fine. And what happens is that it adds up, adds up, adds up. And it turns out that the addition of all these little pieces of exercise are just as important as a big hunk of exercise. Because, you know, think about it. You know, we all go to the gym, right? You guys, everybody goes to the gym and people say, how long did you go to the gym? And you can say, you know, uh, to, to Lauren, how long did you go to the gym? Tell me, Lauren. Okay, Lauren's gonna say like an hour, right? Okay, an hour. Okay, so I write down 60 minutes. Well, what he actually did was he parked he walked into the gym, he got a new towel, he sat down, tied up his shoes. Okay, now it's 20 minutes into it. He uh, combed his hair to make he look good, uh, walked over to one of the machines, did five minutes, sat back down. Oh, there's something neat on the TV, let me watch it. Um, maybe I'm gonna check out this juice bar and see what's over there today. And then he does that and says, well, you know, I think I'm done. So he just did 60 minutes of gym and actually five minutes of intensive exercise. And that five minutes is extremely important. I'm not belittling the 60 minutes at the gym. That can be actually quite fun. But what I'm saying is that it's those little bouts and then running to the car and then doing all those types of things add up and, and give us these bouts of exercise. So those are the, those are the take home lessons. And if you want to go to sleep or go onto your Netflix, go ahead. But uh, I'll try to give you some data which shows you why we do this and what is the reason, reason be, behind it. So... Uh, I don't work alone. Giselle Petzinger, some of you know, is, is my colleague in crime here. Uh, we're also married, but in between that, we, we run a lab and a big research program, and we try to better understand this whole spectrum from what goes on in the lab to what goes on in the clinic to what goes in the community. And especially this is part of our, our what we do now is, 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 is share what we learn from the community. To the, and give back to the community so that we can apply our work and, and hopefully make a difference in, in some people's lives. And that's really our, our goal. So this is a traditional picture of Parkinson's disease for almost the last hundred years. It is the loss of the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra pars compacta here in the midbrain and the loss of the neurotransmission of dopamine into the basal ganglia and hence the loss of neurotransmission. Okay, that's it. Okay, that's what we've been taught. So we need to put back dopamine. Ah, we take cinnamon. Now, is that the whole story? Hell no. And in fact, a lot of the thinking of what we've been going into over the last 20 years is really derived from our, our studies in animal models and in humans. And in fact, we do know that the Parkinson's disease has some very traditional symptoms, bradykinesia, the slowness, the rigidity, this, this, this cogwheel rigidity that, that you have, poor balance, gait disturbance, and especially loss of automaticity. But the other thing that's extremely important is this whole idea of potential cognitive deficits that in fact, there's, there are changes in thinking. 
changes in dual tasking, changes in cognitive processing, which can manifest itself as freezing, freezing of gait or freezing of movement. There can be cognitive overload and cognitive uh, uh, fatigue. There can also be de deficits in visual spatial processing. And in fact, 20 years ago, when we were exercising patients on treadmills to try to understand if exercise actually helped patients, one thing Giselle said was, you know, patients that are not optimized on drugs don't do very well in their physical therapy. Also, patients that are on drugs that they're having troubles in thinking don't do well. And so if they're having cognitive issues because of either over-medicated or under-medicated or not treated, that in fact, there's, there's problems. So that began to really change a lot of our thinking that, well, maybe motor and movement and cognition thinking are intertwined, that they actually are two processes that are dependent on each other. Those of you that are old enough to remember that this was something that, that occurred years ago where we thought of you had motor diseases and you have thinking diseases. You've got Parkinson's or you've got Alzheimer's. The two never meet. It actually turns out that that's not true at all. That in fact, every patient to manifest some degree of thinking problems very early in the disease. And in fact, this, these thinking problems interfere with a lot of the motor problems and the motor problems interfere with the thinking. So the two of them are very, very closely intertwined. And so we're trying to understand this relationship and can you in fact develop different types of exercises which engage both? And I'll tell you, yes, you can. This is called neuro PT or this is called learning. And this is exactly what you do in physical therapy. Every week, I think, and, 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 and know that Lisa and Stephanie mix it up. They always show you some new things and they challenge you. This is called learning. And this is exactly the, the type of process that engages the thinking part of your brain, which then is the next domino or, or, or involved in the moving part of your body. So the two of them go hand in hand. And so this is very, very important. This is why you don't want to go to the gym and get on a treadmill and go at a very slow walking space watching Fox News on the little video. You don't wanna do that because you're not engaging your brain. Your brain's actually probably turned off with some of these news programs. But in fact, you want to engage your brain in everything you do. And I think you, when I was watching Steph and Lisa earlier, you could see that they're giving everybody feedback. They're saying things, they're engaging you cognitively. It's sort of like having your own personal trainer in the room saying to you that, oh, lift your legs higher or do this and, or good job, or let's, let's see if we can do this a little bit faster. Let's do it again, but greater amplitude. Let's lift, lift up your legs and swing your arms and things like that. These are the types of feedback. This is a learning modality. And in fact, this is the type of exercise that engages your brain. And we know this is engages your brain because we can actually see changes within your brain when we engage you cognitively. And I'll show you some of that in just a, a few minutes. But one thing that this upper diagram shows here is that Parkinson's disease is part of a gigantic circuit. Some of you remember how much, what percent of the brain do you use at any one time? Or what percent of the brain do you actually need? And everybody says, oh, you only need about 10%, right? Okay. So give me a tablespoon and let me scoop out a piece of your brain and you tell me if this bothers you. In fact, you use all your brain all the time. You're just not aware of it. And in fact, this last little point here called automaticity is in fact what the majority of your brain does. It allows you to automatically move through your world where you don't have to think about some of the most, let's say trivial things like walking and going upstairs and things like that. However, in the context of Parkinson's, we begin to lose some of our automaticity. And in fact, many of the patients, many of you have to begin to think about what you're doing. So when I'm with a patient and I say, what are you thinking about right now? They're not thinking about lunch. They're, they're not thinking about their, 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 the book they're reading. They're thinking about walking down the hallway. They're thinking about lifting their legs and, and moving their legs and things of that nature. And so it becomes part of their consciousness, part of their their, 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 their immediate thinking. And this can be very, very fatiguing. So they're losing some of that automaticity. What we'd like to do is to see if we can restore some of that automaticity. And so can we in fact restore some of the connections within the brain to create these types of, of, of benefits again? Can we restore some of this? And I'll show you some of that and hopefully in just a few moments. 
But when we think about cognition, we think about thinking, the thinking parts of your brain, all of which are affected in Parkinson's, but also affected in aging. So even though Steph and, and Lisa are, are, are young and vibrant, they have to be very concerned about these issues because they, they may age. I'm not sure yet, but they may, it may happen. So can they age healthy? Yes, they can. Can, can they maintain some of the features of cognition of thinking? Attention, processing speed, executive function, motivation, learning, reaction time, working memory, visual spatial. These are all aspects of, of thinking parts of our brain. And we'd like to always exercise those. And in fact, just as you'd like to try to exercise the muscles in your arms, we also want to try to exercise these features of our brain. Think of the brain almost like a muscle and you always, always, always want to engage it. Always, always want to use it. You always want to exercise it. And this is exactly what we're trying to, to understand better. And this is what really healthy li lifestyle does for us. It allows us to maintain healthy living and healthy brain function. The vast majority of this is in the prefrontal cortex and going, oh, but isn't the disease in the midbrain and the basal ganglia? Yes, it is, but if we go back here, we'll see that many of the connections that engage dopamine actually are connected to the frontal cortex and actually throughout your brain. So your brain is, is, is receiving these motor signals everywhere, which are engaging the thinking signals. And so the two of them together are making us human, human-like, and that's really what, we, what we're trying to do. We also want to think of this concept of resilience and resilience is like, think of it like everybody I know is you guys are all buying electric cars now, right? Right, okay, so you're all buying, we, my son just bought one, so I, I but, but he has to think about resilience in his electrical car and resilience of his electric car, it means he's got to plug it in. He's got to fill those batteries with little electrons and so that they can in fact give him movement to create the ability to drive the car. The same thing happens in the brain, that we want to create this reservoir, this, I, I guess I can't say the, you know, the gas tank anymore, after 2035, none of us will have gas tanks, but we will have batteries. And so we want to charge our batteries. And in fact, we can see this happening throughout life, and we want to understand this better. What causes resilience? And resilience, which we define as the ability of the brain to buffer against disease and recover from injury, it's sort of like insurance. It's sort of like having more gas in the tank so that you can go a little further and not run out of gas. We want to understand that better. And that really has to do a lot with how the brain is connected. And in fact, we can look at the brain and we can draw these really interesting little maps of what's connected to what and how much is it connected and actually this, this little diagram here on the left really kind of shows us that, and you could just say it, every part of the brain is connected to every other part of the brain. And you would not be wrong in saying that. But in fact, with types, with changes in the context of aging or disorders or brain injury, we lose a lot of these connections. We lose a lot of these different routes. It's sort of like those of you who drive around San Francisco, I guess maybe San Francisco is not a good example anymore because you've only, you've, you're kind of like stuck, you got bridges. But if the San Francisco, let's say the Golden Gate Bridge is backed up and you can say, well, maybe you should, I should go over the Dunbarton Bridge and go up through Richmond and then I'll get off, to, you know, we'll get to Napa that way. This is, an, uh, this is part of the connectivity. And that's actually part of the resilience that in fact, we have alternate routes to fix things to kind of go around what's broken. And I'll show you some evidence for that in, in, in just a few seconds here. So some of this comes from some very old information, old in the sense of over the last 40 years, a particular study, old in the sense of these old nuns, which was interesting in this nun study, this is the nuns of Minnesota uh, study. And in fact, they had these nuns and they can follow these nuns for their entire lives into their well into their 90s and they can follow them since they were teenagers and all the way into their 90s and look at how how their quality of life and lifestyle and their ability to write and to think and all these types of things and then at the end of their lives they donated their brains and you can see all these nun brains here uh, um, uh, they're in formaldehyde they're not actually in holy water uh, but in fact you have all these nun brains and when they began to look at these nun brains they're like you know sitting down with them and going oh Obviously, this one has Alzheimer's disease because look at all the Alzheimer's plaques in this brain. Oh, look at the degeneration. Look at the atrophy. Oh, there's all these 
features of Alzheimer's disease. And they go back to Sister Beatrice here and they, they look at her at 95 years of age before she donated her brain and she was sharp as a tack. She didn't show any clinical symptomology of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Oh my God, what the hell does that mean? That means there is a big discourse between brain pathology as we've been defining it for the last 150 years by pathologists in a laboratory and how you function. So in fact, Sister Beatrice here who had Alzheimer's-like pathology never manifested Alzheimer's disease because of her resilience. And what is that resilience? Her capacity to find other ways to solve problems and things like that. The other thing I want to stress is this whole idea of, 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 the, of the concept of stability of the brain. The brain is not an organ that is stable. It's always, always alive. It's always moving. It's always changing. It's changing in a lot of different features. We call this a dynamic brain. And this is actually Walter Cannon back in 1928-9 wrote this book called The Wisdom of the Body. And think of it, the brain is almost like a bicycle. When you ride a bicycle, if you stop your bicycle, you're gonna fall off, right? But if you're riding your bicycle and moving, it's okay. Things are happening. The same thing with the brain. If you keep that brain moving, you won't, it won't fall down. And basically we keep it moving by thinking, by exercising, by engaging it. It's a dy dynamic, dynamic structure. And in fact, this is part of its stability. It's stable because it's moving. The bicycle is stably upright because it's moving. It's kind of like a paradox. You're moving, but yet you're stable. You're moving, but yet you're functional. You're moving. And this is exactly the type of thing that we're trying to do. So this comes actually from, a, from an article we wrote a few years ago, the whole try to understand this concept of exercise or even now diet in terms of the brain health and also what are the molecular changes that are taking place and how that can actually give us beneficial behaviors. So where do we start? Well, 25 years ago, we had someone come to the laboratory, Beth Fisher came to us as a, as a postdoc and she was thinking of a project and we were working on these mice and these mice, we give them a drug called MPTP and they get Parkinson's disease and they get slow and they look like little Parkinsonian people. They're very, you know, they got Parkinson's, but they're mice. So she thought, well, what if we pretended we were like physical therapists for mice and just like you would if for, as, as a physical therapist engage a patient who is having like say knee surgery and knee repair, begin to engage them by moving them, okay? When you have knee surgery or hip surgery, I mean, I had hip surgery and four hours after my surgery, the physical therapist came up to me and says, okay, we're going for a walk and I'm going, bullshit. And she said, nope, we're going for a walk and get up. And so I grabbed my little, 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 uh, I, I wouldn't say it's my Foley catheter, but I had the, you know, the thing and let's go for a walk. So we went and we went for a walk. And this is exactly what physical therapy begins to work is to engage you. So she thought, okay, we're gonna take these mice who have Parkinson's disease and we're gonna exercise them. And when we exercise them, we expect in fact, and you can see them, let's see this, oh, this one's oh, not engaged because this guy's not, he's not, believe me, this one's exercising. And when we exercise them, the whole idea here is that they should in fact get better. And you can see in fact that this, they do, they get better. This is, these are two mice that both have Parkinson's disease by our toxin. And this guy back here has not been exercising. He's the couch potato, he's the lazy one, and he's just falling off the treadmill. This guy, and I can say guys because they're males, this guy has been exercising an hour a day, six weeks, five days a week, and he's chugging along pretty good. So he looks like he's gotten back to like normal, but yet, you know, he had Parkinson's disease. And so in fact, he shows all these features from endurance and velocity. He acts just like a recovered mouse. And in fact, what's really interesting is that when we actually, let me jump to this one. This is the interesting slide here. When you go through physical therapy, you fix what's broken. You fix the knee, you fix the hip, right? That's what you try to do. So in 2002, when we did these experiments, when you exercise a mouse that has Parkinson's disease, that has lost dopamine, because that's the essence of Parkinson's disease, as we thought of it at the time, then if he is behaviorally recovered, 
his motor performance is as good as a normal mouse, he must have put back dopamine, right? That makes sense, right? If your brain is gonna work like it did before, it must go back to the way it was before, fixed, right? Makes sense to me. So <clears throat> when we went into the brain and looked at the brain, and we can look at this through a number of different molecular techniques. One is this dark stain here, and this dark stain is, is the enzyme that helps in the function of dopamine, and you can see six different ones here. And in fact, this is normal, very, very dark. And then with Parkinson's, they get very, very light. But if we go over here and look at exercised, in fact, this exercised mouse did not restore the enzyme for using dopamine. And in fact, when we went into the brain and looked at the amount of dopamine in the brain of a Parkinsonian mouse versus a mouse that is now normal in terms of its motor behavior, but had Parkinson's, there is no new levels of dopamine. And at the time, this was impossible. So when we submitted this to journals to be reviewed and grants to be funded, they basically came back with one word, two syllables. First one sounds like a cow. Bullshit. It's exactly what they said. They said, this is impossible because we know that the human brain the basal ganglia of the human brain does not function normally except with dopamine. And if you're going to function normally, you must put back that dopamine. Okay. Turns out that's not the case. That in fact, there is no new neurogenesis. There are no new cells in the brain anywhere in the brain. And in fact, when we go in and we look at the brain, and we look at its structure. And this is actually a three-dimensional reconstruction of a, of a neuron that's in the basal ganglia. And in fact, this is a normal one. Lots of connections and lots of, kind of looks like a healthy root on a plant that you just pulled out, right? And then with, when it's Parkinsonian, you can see that you've lost a lot of these roots, these arbors are now lost. But yet with exercise, they come back. Interesting. And this is just a slice through the brain of a mouse and in fact, all these little black spots here are just some of the neurons that we've, we've labeled with this technique and we can measure them and look at them. And in fact, see that there's the restoration of this function of the structure of these particular neurons. So these neurons are looking different after the exercise. There's no new dopamine. However, when we look at the amount of dopamine that you have and how you use it, we see something that's quite remarkable. And what that is, is two things here. One is that we can actually go through a slice of the brain and just ask, when I give you a little electrical shock and you emit some dopamine, how much dopamine gets released? And in fact, there's no difference in the total amount of dopamine. However, when I ask, how much do you release at any one time, there's this huge elevation. And you're like, oh my gosh, that must mean what little dopamine you have left, you're using it differently. It's sort of like being on a, like a, like a, I was going to say a hockey team and you've got like six guys in your hockey team are now injured and suddenly you're down from 20 players down to 14, but yet you still play. You've got less players, but you still got a team and you still have a game. You haven't put back the number of players. You may be winning, but you didn't add more players to win. You just made who's left over work harder. And that's exactly the, what we see happen. We also see changes in a couple of other things with dopamine. Dopamine receptors change, dopamine transporters change. The, what, means, what this means is that what less dopamine we have, we're using it differently. Different receptor profile, different what we call synaptic occupancy. What little you have, you're, you, it's working harder. It's sort of like, 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 like kicking the butt and it's working, working, working harder. It's sort of like anybody here, Shakespeare, I love Shakespeare. One of my favorite speeches of all Shakespeare is in Henry V. And Henry V, when they have that first charge in, 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 in the, the battle with the French and they come back, got their butts kicked and they all come back and they regroup. And then Henry, the, one of the guys, the soldiers complains, I wish there were more of us. And he's like, what? What do you mean more of us? Then we'd have to share our fame. And in fact, if we just work a little harder, and this is a big speech, work a little bit harder, we can slaughter them. And that's exactly what he did. And so he had fewer men who won the war rather than having more men win the war. So we're seeing the same thing in the human brain here. There's less dopamine, 
but it's working harder. And in fact, what's happening is that this, 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 so this problem that the brain was faced with, and this problem was running on a treadmill, the animal solved it. The animal was forced to learn a new skill, to do something new. And when it solved that problem, it found a way to solve it in the brain that was different than what the brain looked like before. I just wanna flip a little bit and talk a little bit about energy. And I'll talk about energy because energy is the foundation of what we think of why this happens. And, and in fact, it's very, very important. Can I ask Somebody, you yeah, please. Okay. okay, so my question is about um, the dopamine you know, being more efficient or more connected. What about starting early in your exercise program and making these brain changes early versus later on? Um, can you just speak on that? I mean, do, we, we always like to say that it's best to start early before the apathy and bradykinesia sets in, but what, is there any research or evidence as, as you practice this later on in the disease progression? Yeah, a couple of things. One is that there's never a bad time to start exercising. And yes, earlier the better. And this is why we stress this as lifestyle. Early may be, uh, you as an adolescent. This is where we begin to build resilience. This is why we do things of lifestyle that, that hopefully will be beneficial. Exercise, diet, stress, immune, microbiome, don't smoke, don't drink a bottle of vodka a day, all these types of things you wanna start very early in life. <clears throat> so we, we do know that, that, that and, the, and the other thing is that when you're early in earlier stages of disease, you can do more. You, you've got more capacity to do things like exercise, physical th therapy, physical activity, you can engage much better. And so you can, you know, start, and, and the evidence seems to indicate that that is in fact the case, that when patients do start earlier in, in, in their stage of disease, the benefits last longer. You can see that in quality of life, in the amount of dopamine replacement therapy, you can see it in disease progression, you can see it in a lot of different things. So yeah, definitely, you know, definitely right, you know, early. When does Parkinson's disease start? We actually don't really know, but, but it starts long before the motor symptoms. Some patients, some of you may have lost a sense of smell a decade before Parkinson's. Some of you may have these types of issues before the motor happens. Certainly, you know, with other disorders like Huntington's, we can see teenagers with changes in brain function but yet they're 30 years before clinical symptoms. And so, so this may be how the brain, and one thing the most remarkable about the, the human brain is that it has an amazing capacity to compensate. And so in fact, even very early changes, it can compensate for and find, and find ways to, to, to manifest recovery or manifest behaviors and kind of buffer or be resilient to the eventual changes. Why are these eventual changes happening? What brings you into the clinic? We don't exactly know why, but it just seems that maybe we hit a cliff. We hit, hit a, a time when we just can't compensate anymore. We've lost some capacity to compensate. We don't know all the rules of that. Is that the number of connections? Is that the number of pathways? Is that the loss of, of this phenomena that we call neuroplasticity? We lose neuroplasticity as we age. This is why it's easier to learn a language when you're five years old than when you're 55. That's called plasticity, neuroplasticity. It changes over the lifetime. It doesn't mean it, you can't learn a language after 55. It just becomes more and more difficult. The same thing with recovering from brain injury, that as a young person, you can recover much faster and heal faster. An older person may not be able to. So we don't know all those types, types of rules. So that's very, very, you know, we're trying to find out, you know, figure that out. We also don't stop disease progression. And I don't know, you know, if we stop disease progression and then can modify the pathway of the brain, maybe that'll be a cure. You kind of like put the disease on hold and then you surpass it with recovery through physical therapy and physical activity. That to me would be pretty damn good. It may not be the perfect cure, but it stops the disease progression. And I think we see that in patients that now going 10, 20 years 
<clears throat> with with uh, the disorder, that's modifying disease progression. That's pretty impressive. Um, so this is the type of thing that we'd like to you know try to get to. So thinking about why this happens has really got to do with with energy and mitochondria. And I'll just try to you know I'm only gonna you know I'm not gonna I could talk for hours and hours, but I won't. So just to make sure, um, but I'll just try to give you some of the highlights here. And our thinking that's going on in the laboratory right now, the thinking of, of, of approaching these little, these little engines in our brains, en engines that are inside of our neurons that make energy, they make ATP. And we're trying to understand the relationship between the outer world and the inner world, physical activity and activity of the neuron, and also the activity of a different cell type. And this is the different cell. This, this is a new way of thinking of what's going on in the brain here. Just look over the left here. We have our two neurons that talk to each other, the two blue neurons. They communicate through a number of different neurotransmitters, glutamate, maybe using dopamine, that type of thing. So they communicate with each other, but they don't communicate by themselves. And in fact, there's this interesting cell, and this cell is called an astrocyte. And in fact, this astrocyte, in terms of the number of astrocytes that are in your brain, exceed the number of neurons in your brain. You have 86 billion neurons in your brain. You have about 100 billion astrocytes. They must be important, and they are very important. And they do a couple of really cool things. One of the things that they do is they monitor the synapse. They monitor the connection between two neurons. They actually engulf it in what's called a leaflet. So they actually hug it and, and go around it, and they, and they survey it. And one neuron, one astrocyte can survey over 2 million synapses, 2 million connections and going, whoa. So you got like 100 billion and they can each do 2 million. That's a lot of neurons and that's a lot of synapses. That's a pretty responsible thing to do. They can also regulate and monitor the connections between the blood, bloodstream and the neuron. And in fact, they are a bridge between what's going on in the bloodstream and what's going on with the neuron. And one of the things that they're responsible for, and this is shown on the right-hand side here, is the transfer of important molecules for energy for the neuron. One of them is glucose. However, I'm gonna tell you in a couple of seconds, another really important one is called lactate. And, and in fact, lactate turns out to be a molecule which is probably more important than glucose for your brain. And let me see if I can. Um, when you think about exercising, one, one thing that we learned in biology and in gym class is that when you exercise, you make lactic acid and this lactic acid builds up in your muscles and it causes you to cramp. And so therefore your coach says, okay, let's walk it off. Okay, so you don't cramp up. And we used to think of, of lactic acid as something that's bad for you. Louis Pasteur identified lactic acid as being a bad thing because he figured out that when you have bacteria and yeast that live in conditions without oxygen, they begin to metabolize the sugars in grapes and make vinegar instead of wine. And you're like, oh, okay, so that's something wrong. The same thing with certain bacteria that come in and they make lactic acid. That's good when you wanna make pickles, that's not good when you wanna make wine. Turns out Louis Pasteur screwed things up by making us think one way. And also our coaches screwed things up by making us think that lactic acid is bad for you. Turns out we actually don't make lactic acid. We make what's called lactate. And in fact, lactate is an incredibly important molecule. And it's such an important molecule that in fact, your brain actually switches over to using lactate. We used to think of glucose as the molecule, the sugars that we use to feed the brain. In fact, that's not really true at all. And in fact, in parts of our brain, when under high energy demands, we'll actually switch from using glucose to using lactate. And they use lactate for two things. One is as an energy source to make more ATP, to make more energy, but also lactate, interestingly enough, is not only an energy source, 
It's also a signaling molecule, like a hormone. It's like fertilizer. It's sort of like can act as both something you can eat and something you can put on your plants simultaneously. It can signal. And so what it can actually do is to identify connections in your brain that are working, feed them, but at the same time can also consolidate them and select for them. And this is extremely important when we think about neuroplasticity, that in fact, the astrocyte may be the quarterback between making new connections and strengthening connections. And in fact, that seems to be the case. And so we're trying to understand that much, much better now. So we can look at this whole idea of, of the conversion, the movement of glucose or lactate in our bloodstream taken up by the astrocyte and directly fed to the neuron to strengthen the neurons. And in fact, to act as the fertilizer and act as the energy source simultaneously. And this becomes you know, a potentially really, really exciting, exciting thing. We be are beginning to understand that in fact, many disorders of the brain are disorders, not of the neurons, but disorders of the astrocytes. And in fact, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, is actually now thought of as a disease of the astrocyte. And the disease, it's sort of like having your football team that has lost its quarterback. You may be losing other aspects of the game, not because you're losing all your other players, because you've lost one essential player. And when you lose that one essential player, the astrocyte, in fact, can make sick neurons. They're no longer there to help or support the neurons, and in fact, can, can, can lead to the death or dysfunction of the neurons. But yet the disease is in another cell. The relationship has been lost, and it's sort of, sort of like the, 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 the balance between them has, has been lost. So in terms of thinking of, of lactate and the brain and the role in the brain, we began to think of it as a molecule that links movement, and this is why you want to move. This is why we do physical therapy, but it's also a molecule that gets into the brain and begins to dictate the function and the changes that take place with, 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 within the brain. And in fact, can link physical activity with neuronal activity. Moving of the body and moving of the brain and its connections can in fact are, 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 are synchronized between the two. And when we think of how fast lactate builds up, it builds up really, really fast. And in fact, within just a minute or two of exercise, a minute or two of going upstairs, a minute or two of, of, of running across your lawn to go get your, your, your pet dog or, or to go chase something or on a treadmill, it goes skyrocket. It actually goes up several hundred fold in your brain from 0.1 millimolar up to as much as 30 millimolars within just a few minutes. And it stays up very, very high. And in fact, many parts of your brain begin to utilize lactate, but not glucose. So they're using another energy source, an energy source that is only there when you move. That's not there when you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, when you tend to live off of glucose. It's actually doing something really interesting. It's creating this energetic synergism. And in fact, the astrocytes themselves are so specialized that they almost only make lactate. They turn off all the energy sources that make, that use mitochondria, that use the little factories to make what's usually energy. And in fact, can, can, can donate this intermediate to a neuron and the neuron, instead of using glucose, sugars, uses lactate as its energy source. And so it begins, begins to utilize that. In fact, when we think of feeding the brain, we can kind of like look at it like this. When you're at, at rest, usually it's glucose. Okay, this is why, you know, regulate insulin and glycogen and all glycogon and all that types of stuff. It's mostly glucose. Later on, it can become lactate. Later on, it can become fats. And later on, it can become proteins. We don't want to get into the proteins because this is called uh, sarco sarcopenia. This is the breakdown of muscle. We don't want to get there. We do, in fact, can get into the fats. In fact, you can get to this point within about 20 minutes. And in fact, when we begin to think of what's happening at rest, you're mostly glucose. 
very little lactate, very little fats, very little protein. Your brain is eating glucose. It's eating the basic simple sugars. However, when you begin to exercise, especially at high intensity, in fact, you lower the amount of glucose you use and you start using lactate. So you're using a new molecular source. Why is that interesting and important? Because it changes synapses. It changes connections in the brain. It begins to signal just like a fertilizer in terms of identifying those circuits that you are using at that moment. So when you're on a treadmill, on a bicycle, when you're doing your, your, your aerobics, uh, you're doing your balance, you're doing all those types of movements, you're doing your Tai Chi, you're doing all these types of things. This lactate is now promoting all of those molecular changes to begin to take place. It's sort of synchronizing movement of the body with circuits in the brain that you're using and it's creating these links. It's actually the reason that neuroplasticity in fact works. So, so in fact, we can begin to, to, to look at this and what exactly physical activity is doing for us. Yes, there are benefits from it, but in fact, we can see that there are, are underlying molecular mechanisms that are responsible for it. And as I mentioned earlier, lowers the risk of Parkinson's in the population, lowers certainly mortality and morbidity. Um, it is enhancing cognition and thinking. We all think better and feel better when we exercise. Things become much more clear. Your, your, your ability to, to, to think and cognition is much more improved. And we do know from a number of studies that we've done in the laboratory that the magic number is 150 minutes is very, very important. What is exercise and physical activity? Physical activity is doing anything. It's just getting up and walking and doing housework and gardening and all these types of things. And you can do that at a fairly intense level. Exercise is really taking physical activity and making it purposeful, repetitive, structured and swimming and, and running and cycling and weightlifting and also all those types of things. But you can see the two of them are really quite you know, intertwined in terms of, 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 of how they impact the brain. I don't have to, time to go into a number of studies, but I just wanna show you that we are doing these studies and we do these studies and we can look at some very important parameters. And one of the fundamental parameters is doctor or Stephanie or Lisa, how active should I be? Should I be light? Should I be moderate? Should I be vigorous? And it turns out that a large study that we've carried out over several years really, and here's the data, okay, I'm just gonna skip through it just to show that we have the data. But in fact, what happens is that, in fact, patients, subjects, people who have better cognition have higher degrees of physical activity. The two go hand in hand. What's the magic cutoff? What's the magic threshold? It turns out to be 150 minutes. Above 150 minutes of moderate to physical exercise shows the greatest amount of benefit. You can also get the greatest amount of benefit by just doing anything in any length of time. And in fact, we used to think, oh, it had to be in 10 minute bouts. It doesn't, it can be in two minute bouts. Very, very short, phys high, phys moderate to phys uh, vigorous physical activity is very beneficial. Five times at two minutes is just as good at one, as one time at 10 minutes. It doesn't matter. And it can be any time during the day because you're going to build up that lactic acid at lactate. You're going <laughs> to, let's get lactic acid out of our brain because it's lactate. You're going to build up that lactate. You're going to use those motor circuits and together they're going to synchronize and they're going to make new connections. And we're finding a lot of data. We have lots of lots of data that describes this, and we can we can send you articles on 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 this. But really, we're we're showing that in fact. And it, the other thing that's really important when you look at subjects and patients who have high degrees of physical activity, you also see benefits in these other aspects of thinking, of cognition, language, visual spatial function, executive function, multitasking, cognitive flexibility. All, all change and great, give you great benefit. And I'm just gonna show you one quick little experiment here to show you something I think is really convincing in terms of, of demonstrating. We can take mice and we can give them Parkinson's disease. We can then exercise them and then we can look at their brains. Unlike patients, 
rats and mice donate their brains to us in the laboratory so we can use them. And in fact, when we ask a very simple question, and you'll ask this, and this is what, what Stephanie and Lisa always stress and always are, ask, are asked is, what type of exercise should I do? And should I just get on the treadmill and kind of walk along and, and, and read People magazine? Or should I really begin to engage? Should I do something different? Like maybe instead of walking on treadmill, maybe I should go walk in the forest on a trail. Maybe I should do some trail running. Maybe I should change my route. Maybe I should do some other things. Ah, why? Yes, we know that we should. Why? Where's the, where's the molecular evidence? Well, this is what our, our little rodents have done for us. We can ask the same question. We can take a group of mice or rats and we can give them aerobic exercise, which is, is, is just on a very simple, doesn't engage their brain. They just sit on this very nice, easy wheel and they just walk along. We can also take these same these different rats and mice and we can put them on a complex wheel. We can challenge them. We can take out these little rungs and now you can see that the mouse or the rat has to think about all the movements. It's got it's getting engaged. It's like it's like when you speed up the treadmill or you're walking on the trail and you see some roots and rocks. You got to start thinking about those things. You got to engage your brain. And this is exactly what they do. Even though they're exercising at the same intensity we then look at their brain and we see, in fact, oh my gosh, those animals that have Parkinson's that are exercising in a very cognitively engaging form of exercise actually engage the thinking parts of their brain. And in fact, this transfers over to other cognitive benefits. And you're like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. So that must mean that if I exercise and use a form of exercise that engages my brain, engages my thinking, becomes a learning modality, I will get greater benefit out of it than I would if I just did slow treadmill walking without thinking. And exactly, yes, that is the case. We can also show that connections to other parts of the brain are altered. And in fact, the system is different. What's important here, there's no new cells, there's no new transmitters, there are new connections. The brain has found a way to solve a problem of movement by using the thinking and cognitive aspects of the motor system to create new connections. We can show this in the rat, in the mouse, and we recently showed it in humans using uh, neuroimaging. That in fact, this is exactly what happens. So you are, like a rat. In fact, your brain will change in the context of its experience. And we see this, this, these types of changes. And we got lots of data, really neat paper that just came out a few weeks ago that shows this. Probably one of the few papers in the world that actually shows these types of changes in the circuitry of the brain in the context of an experience. Now we're trying to replicate this in humans. And we've been able to show this in some of the network changes in humans. So it's becoming you know, really, really quite remarkable. Um, Giselle has probably talked to you guys about some of this data. I just have it on here because it's great data. It's lots and lots of effort and money and lots of people who are responsible for this. But we do know when you are physically active, you are also, also cognitively active, cognitive benefit. The two go hand in hand that we, we, we can't really separate the two. And in, and, in, and in fact, the, the two go, go together. The thinking and the movement go together. So when you improve one, you improve the other. And when you want to improve thinking, you engage thinking in the type of motor behavior, physical activity, physical therapy that you do. This is why every week that, or every day it sounds like in terms of what you guys are doing is that Lisa and Steph are mixing it up. Okay, today we did a lot of balance. Today, you know, tomorrow we're going to do a lot of, 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 of movement through space with our arms. Next day, it's going to be the legs. Then it's going to be core. Then it's going to be using one of those balls. And then it's going to be juggling. And then it's going to be picking up something. It's always, always changing. It's always engaging, a great gauge in the brain. And we can use this even over the long term, a couple of years, that we can see that those individuals with high levels of motor fitness also have high level levels of cognitive function. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's actually really important. That must mean the disease is very different. 
Staying active is extremely beneficial. Sedentary, we know, is, is I wouldn't say it's destructive, but we can do better. We can actually begin, begin to engage, engage our brain. And we can see this in, in, in just, this, this is almost like, you know, I showed you the rat brain. We see it in the human brain too. You, you're not, you, you guys are all biological. You're, you're not different, okay? The same thing happens in your brain as is happening in the, in, 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 the, in the rodent brain. So last point, take home lessons. Brain resilience is defined as the ability of the brain to buffer against disease, recover from injury, and involves the strengthening of neural connections through metabolism, creating new connections, which we call synaptogenesis, and re <coughs> re uh, recruiting new circuits, making new connections. Some of those highways are already there. We may not use them, but now we are beginning to use them. And you don't have to take pictures of this. I can send the slide set up to those guys. You could post it, okay? And you guys can, my data is, is shared with everybody. I, I'm, in, I'm into the you know, public domain here. Metabolism involves energy production from neurons and their connections. This is what exercise does. Exercise improves metabolism. It promotes these non-neurons, the astrocytes, to function at a higher level, both metabolically and as fertilizers, which we call trophic factors, to promote neuron health and to create new connections. We know intensity is extremely important. It's a parameter that we need to achieve. 150 minutes per week seems to be the magic number in terms of 30 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous exercise improves cognitive function and boosts brain metabolism through a number of mechanisms, including that of lactate. The exercise must be skilled. It's an important parameter for executive function, for thinking, for cognition, to promote specific blood flow in specific regions of the brain. And as I showed you, also region and circuit specific changes in metabolism. It targets the parts of the brain that we're trying to protect, to trying to restore and trying to maintain, the thinking part of our brains and the motor parts of the brains. Those are going hand in hand. I could even convert point number two, instead of saying metabolism, I could also say diet. Diet is almost as important now, and I don't have time to talk about it today, but maybe next time, I'm happy to talk about diet. But we have a study that we're trying to start up right now and trying to get funded, and this is why I buzz up all night writing, helping write this grant, to look at the effect of diet on brain health, diet on the connections, and it's huge. And if I had to say one thing, you know, if you just had to do one diet thing, just one thing, cut out sugars, cut out simple sugars. Now, those of you who are of, of East European descent are thinking, oh my gosh, I can't eat potatoes. No, 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 no. A potato is not simple sugar. A potato is a complex carbohydrate. So you can eat as many potatoes as you want. Stay away from the simple sugars. Because remember I told you, we convert from glucose into lactate, right? Glucose goes down, lactate goes up. The body-brain connection is established. Now, if you're taking in a lot of sugar, you're not going to see that difference. You're going to mask. You're going to you're going to you're going to overcome our ability to switch over to lactate. We don't want that. You want to leave an open template so that you can reduce your simple sugars like glucose, elevate lactate and other molecules, so that you can get the benefits in circuit establishment and synaptogenesis. So, no sodas no juices except fresh squeeze and if you want to rush you and it, it it is better for your brain to get 20 grams of sugar from a nectarine than to get 20 grams of sugar from a coke or a a a monster drink those are just bad for you and i and if i have you know i just have to say it. it's bad okay it's evil you might as well just smoke a cigarette and, and walk down the highway it's that bad and, and I don't think you want to do that. So, and then also really pay attention. To, don't, I would get rid of fast food. Dr. Petzinger says, just no fast food. Well, you know, you just, well, no, you don't. Those of you who bake bread, don't use sugar, right? Except for the starter. When you go into In-N-Out Burger or a burger place and you get a bread, the bread has 30 grams of sugar in that bun. There's no way in, 30 grams of sugar is like that in your hands. You don't put that into bread. They do because, oh, it tastes really good. I'm going to come back for more. They're, they're, the, they're the, the J.R. Reynolds of the food world. Stay away from it. Make your own stuff. 
the study that we're doing right now, and I'm happy to, to see if I can send up some articles to Lisa and Stephanie to distribute some, we're trying to, we're writing our own right now. We've got some other in the literature, the whole idea of the Mediterranean diet or what we call the mind diet, which is actually better than Mediterranean diet. The mind diet is a diet of, of low sugars, low simple sugars, uh, but high on other fun things. Okay, lots of good, you know, good red wine in there and some nice goat cheeses and lots of berries and lots of green leaves. Extremely important to you, extremely, extremely good. We haven't, you guys have been probably hearing a lot about microbiome and microbiota. That's part of it, but also this whole idea of, of molecules to the brain is very different and diet is so important. Last point to also make is socializing. Socializing, not socialism, socializing. Those of you who are you know, thinking of other things, not communism, it's interaction. And in fact, a few years ago, we had a control group that we called the social group and we imaged their brains and we imaged the brains of exercisers and it turned out to be almost the same which means that exercise and socializing have as much positive impact on the brain as anything else. So being with somebody, uh, being with a group like this, I know it's Zoom, but, I, but if you can do things live is, is really important. Can you find a friend or two to go for a walk, to go for you know, a trail walk, to go up, you know, climb Mount Tam. You know, I should mountain bike down that, but go up, you know, cross the Golden Gate Bridge, go to the Presidio and, you know, go find a nice coffee shop and walk to North Beach or walk over to, you know, the Berkeley Hills. I mean, do that as a social setting. Incredibly important on brain function. Incredible. And I can't stress that. The funniest thing is I haven't talked about any new drugs, right? There's no new drugs here. Pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in what we do. We can't get them to fund any of this because we can't put this in a bottle. Diet, exercise, socializing, stress management, immune microbiota are all free and easy. And they're all parts of lifestyle. But you have to put that as part of your regimen. So it's up there with, I know, I, I hate to say it, but as we get older, we think about some of the simple things in life. like. You know, ask your spouse, how was your bowel movement today? Did you have one? Well, yes, I did. Okay, that's important because if you don't, that's a bad sign. Uh, let's go out and get a salad. Let's make our own salad. Let's go for a walk. Let's watch the tape again and exercise. Okay, let's, let's go out and do these types of things. Huge, 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 huge. Absolutely amazing. And we have patients, Giselle has patients who had all kinds of thinking problems when they changed their diet and got more physically active, it was as good as, 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 as other drugs that could be taken. It's really quite, it doesn't cure, it doesn't replace, it complements and supplements. But for some patients, it's, it's really remarkable. You know, and I think, you know, stress that, I can't stress it enough, but it's so, so important to, to, to do this. And so these are just some of the people that help out on this work. I think I've, I've lost, ran out of space, but uh, it's, it's a, it's not a village, it's a city of people. These are part of our team over the years, students who've gone on and, and uh, done things and other professors and, and, and colleagues of ours and uh, all of our, our collaborators and over the years. And, and really, you know, like I said, 22 years ago, diet and exercise, so we're socializing, weren't, weren't even on the radar of Parkinson's disease. Actually, many Parkinson's doctors still don't talk about it, but they have to. And I think this is what uh, people like Lisa and Steph do for you. They tell you what you what the doctor should be telling you. Lifestyle is extremely important. So thank you for your time, guys. I'm happy to hang out for some questions or some thoughts or whatever. I mean, I'm, I've, I've got nowhere to go. I'm exhausted from You're you know, exhausted. working, but uh, I, I, I hope uh, uh, I've shared with you some aspects of, of, of what's going on. And no matter when you start, no matter who you are, you're going to see benefits somehow, okay? It doesn't matter. You're going to see benefits. And I think if throughout their entire lifespan, we're going to see benefits when we do these types of things. It's really, it's really quite, uh, quite a, a remarkable thing. So, I, uh, you know, I mean, you, you guys are the evidence. Our, our patients are the evidence. Our, our students are the evidence. And, and that's, it's really, really quite, quite important, remarkable. So, um, Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, you know, we just Wonderful. came back. We're still on the road because we're on our way back from Seattle where we were at PD school where we spent, an, you know, seven days straight of teaching 
understanding and living lifestyle change, the diet, the pooping, how many times, you know, <laughs> beans on beans, the mind diet. It was in the Mediterranean versus the mind diet. Right. Which is right. <laughs> but the coolest thing I love about this lecture today is really how you show the mechanism. It's not just, oh, we see these changes happening when we observe people. No, you're really showing us the science behind that. And that says a lot. So thank you so much. Absolutely. We do have a couple of we questions. We do have a couple of questions. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them were answered. Um, can you speak about vigorous exercising before eating? Uh, for example, after coffee, but before breakfast versus exercising after eating? Yeah, I, I think it just when you when you want. So this is actually something I think uh, is interesting. Some of you have heard that, you know, certain types of diet when you're on Parkinson's and taking your meds, you know, the, the diet med interaction. Giselle basically says, throw that out the window. Just eat, you know, because if anything, Parkinson's doesn't make you fat. Um, and in fact, there are energetic metabolic changes taking place that you know you tend to be underweight. So just eat, do whatever. That's very, very important. Exercise when you feel like it. Um, exercise uh, when you don't feel like it. And so if, if you know, a, a quick pace walk over to uh, your, your favorite coffee shop, uh, important, do it. Um, I don't think that there's any detriment. The only, you know, someone asked me, you know, is there any bad time to exercise, any dangerous time to go for a run? The only time I can think that is dangerous to go for a run if there's a minefield, you know, don't run through a minefield. And that's about it. And any other time is just, you know, uh, sometimes it's just make sure there's a bathroom nearby if you need it. If not, you know, who cares? I mean, you just say, it's a nice tree, okay. But uh, no, there's really no, there's no risks that, uh, to, to exercise and diet interactions. Um, you know, you're now, nah. you know, some people have the weirdest food things. They'll have their like big kale smoothie and they'll go for a run. It's like, and they'll burp all the time. It's like, my gosh, what the hell is that? But it's okay. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely fine. So I, I, yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And showing the lactic diagram, you mentioned that the buildup would be in about 20 minutes. So that wouldn't happen with a five minute bouts? No, no, no. It's actually much faster. I, I think the diagram is about one to two minutes. You can see a buildup of lactate very, very quickly. And, and in fact, we used to think of lactate being made because the muscles don't have oxygen, right? That's, that was the thought because that's based on on Louis Pasteur and his bacteria and yeast. They make lactic acid, they make pickles when you put them in a jar without oxygen, right? Okay, those of you who make sauerkraut, that's, that's how you do it, you deprive them of oxygen. And then they convert over to a different form of energy production that doesn't use oxygen, we call it anaerobic glycolysis. And instead of making making uh, pyruvate, which goes into the mitochondria, they make lactate or ethanol, lactic acid or ethanol. Turns out the muscles really don't work the same way. Your brain and your muscles are rarely, rarely without oxygen. You always have oxygen around. When don't you have oxygen? Probably when you're dead. That's about the only time I can think of, or, if, or you know, that, that's about it. The rest of the time you have oxygen around. However, there are mechanisms that we don't quite understand all the details, but when you exercise or when there's a lot of activity, muscle makes myokines, fat tissue makes adipokines, bone makes osteocalcins and osteokines. They make all these molecules. There's a whole bunch of different ones. And there's probably a lot of redundancy. Many, many different, different molecules are made which then activate mechanisms of metabolism that make lactate within minutes. And, and, and in fact, they can, that, that lactate can then get into the brain. And it turns out that a lot of these other molecules get in the brain too. Uh, some of you may have heard of leptin or ghrelin. These are two molecules that kind of like, I'm hungry or not hungry. They kind of like turn off this balance between, are you hungry or not hungry? One's made by fat and one's made by an empty stomach. And they kind of, kind of do that in your brain and, and your, your parts of your brain think they're hungry and that you start you know, eating or not eating. And these actually get into the brain and can cause changes in connections in the brain. 
and 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 we're beginning to see some of these and begin to dissect this out uh, um, also. So it happens quickly. This is why the boats, even short boats. The other thing that's really interesting is that when you go for like a hundred meter run, let's say you're running a hundred meters down the track, it takes you. Let's say how how fast are you? I'd say Steve Brock, you're probably about eleven seconds, twelve second runner in hundred meters. Okay, so you do that now. When you're finished your 100 meters, does everything stop? Like go back to normal, like they were at the beginning? Your heart rate, sweating, uh, your pulse, uh, your metabolism, your, do those change? They actually persist. They will persist for actually several, several minutes. So the body is experiencing this high bout of intensity, even when you stop the intensity. And, 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 and so you can kind of like, you know, actually, you know, do a fast run and then for five minutes, you still experience these metabolic changes. So your one, your your eleven second run is actually a five minute body experience. Could that be part of this bout? I think it is, and 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 the evidence seems to indicate that, that is the case. So you can see how quickly you can do this at at at, at any point. So you don't have to go out and do, you know, we used to have this old rule. I don't. Know, they told this to to people is that. If you want to burn off fat, you got to run for at least 20 minutes, right? Okay, because then you convert over breaking down fat, which is true because if you looked at that that's that signature I had where glucose is first, lactate's that, and then you start breaking down fat, you actually start breaking down fat at about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, that makes sense. The other thing I know someone's thinking about this right now is, oh, I've heard of the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet, I know... Some people are, are thinking of it or they're thinking of fasting as benefits for brain health. Well, yeah, that's, that's cool, but you don't have to do anything about it. What you need to do is just simply exercise. When you exercise, your body actually goes into ketogenic state. You actually begin, to, remember that you have the lactate, glucose goes down, lactate may go up, but then the fat's going up. You start breaking down fats and you break down fats into these little pieces of fat. And these are called short chain fatty acids. And some of them are part of the ketogenic diet. And so you actually go into this ketogenic state. So instead of going out and buying a $45 ketogenic meal, you can just go for a 45 minute walk and you will get ketogenic. You can also begin to fast. And in fact, it's probably good to fast, but you can fast without just like, just skip lunch. That's a fasting. I mean, sometimes when I'm working in the lab here, I had my dinner the night before at six, I come into breakfast, I have a coffee, and then I skip lunch because I'm too busy. And my next meal is at six or seven. I've gone 24 hours without eating. That's fasting. And in fact, during that time period, you can now get the benefits of intermittent fasting just by skipping a meal. We evolved. I mean, the other, the other thing is that's, I don't know, we learn from, from history. We learn from evolution. The human brain has had 7 million years to evolve and to figure out how to eat and move and think in this world. And it solved many, many different things. We didn't eat three meals a day. Actually, that's kind of rare. Eating three meals a day is a very modern thing. And in fact, in the old days, probably before, you know, like even 100, 200 years ago, you ate like once a day. Those of you who can remember, if you're old enough, remember way back maybe two, three million years ago, that in fact, when we sat around eating, that you got a zebra once a month. You didn't eat every day. And you may, you may in fact, get food tomorrow, you hope. You didn't have anything today. Maybe I'll find a few berries, but we certainly didn't have anything sub substantial. That's how the brain worked. And we evolved that. And in fact, it's kind of funny because you guys have read something for example, when you give a rat or a human too much fats, they get stupid, right? They put them in little mazes and they're stupid. You're thinking, wow, I should stay away from fats. And I'm like, no, 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 no. What that means is that when you are eating and you're sitting around in your cave millions of years ago and you're just eating this big fat zebra, you should just enjoy that and just do stupid things like art, mate, do all those kinds of stupid things. Now, when you're hungry and you don't have fats to eat, you are starving. So what you should you do, you should get smarter because now you're gonna have to go out into the Serengeti 
and walk for 17, 18 miles to go find a new zebra and find your way back. So you've got to be pretty smart to do that. Your, you, your cognition goes way, way up. So that's what's happening. So when you eat a food, certain food and become stupid, that means you've eaten and you're fine. Sit around and enjoy it. Now, when you're hungry, get smart because you got to go find food. Unfortunately, none of us chase zebras anymore. That's pretty rare. Um, we, 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 we Uber foods and we get something instantaneously. Well, maybe we should get away from that. Maybe go walk for our foods. So walk across town, you know, go, go, go down, you know, two miles of Telegraph Avenue to go find your pizza. I mean, rather than, than, uh, than have it ordered for you. And maybe we'll, be, we'll be, begin to relive what our brain evolved to do in terms of, of these types of things. So that's kind of, you know, so that's, an, you know, another, another thing. So I think we've learned a lot from, from nature in terms of, of the holistic aspects of what's going on here. You know, we're just rediscovering it. So sorry to ramble there, but. That's a really good segue though into our next question, which oh. we're getting really close to, uh, we need to wrap this up, but we appreciate you so much. And I know oh. how exhausted you are, but we did have a question about, Steph, can you read that? Yeah, one system? method of providing activity that cha that changes and engages patients is off-the-shelf virtual reality programs. Does your lab use or recommend virtual reality systems in your research? Um, okay, since we're I'm amongst friends, I can share with you my prejudices. And one of my prejudices, I'm sort of anti-virtual reality because I think that the brain has to experience movement. It's sort of like, um, almost anything I think that, that, that we do for our brain to learn is that we have to engage in the activity and we can't just think about the activity. And when you just think about the activity, you don't engage the motor circuits that are necessary to execute and to learn. For example, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just going to guess, Richard, this is your question, right? Okay, I just, I could self write from your smile. Okay. Now, you want to learn to, you, you, you know, you want to, you want to join the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, Curry and those guys, and you're going to go, I'm going to do three point, you know, shots. Okay. I'm going to take the basketball and I'm going to throw it into the, into the three points. And I'm going to do it from like 40 feet away. I'm going to read about it. I'm going to read about it. And then I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it in virtual reality. I'm gonna put a little mask on. I'm gonna watch the ball arc. Are you gonna learn how to make a three point shot from forty feet out? No, well, I don't. No, I, I don't use the games that simulate baseball or basketball. I use the activities that are pure exercise. Yeah, like HIIT. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that one of the things, and if, and if you listen to, to, to uh, Lisa and Stephanie, they always give you feedback because the feedback is a form of correction. We need feedback because what we're trying to do is to get a reward. And error is the number one driving force for learning a new skill, any skill. And when we learn a new skill, we're wrong, wrong, wrong. Oh, right 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 we go through this learning curve of being wrong and you are wrong because of the feedback that's given given to you so now we can mix virtual reality and real movement people do this on treadmills with with masks and they can then then see obstacles that they have to walk around but that is actually not the same thing as you being on a trail, walking over real obstacles and maybe even tripping or hitting your foot or that type of thing. So in fact, we need to get this stimulation. There's a body of literature out there that I've read and, and seen that in fact talks about this experience. And one thing that's remarkable about dopamine and its circuitry is that it does things like prediction. And it predicts and evaluates the success or failure of any event. This is why, this is this is why cell phones are so addictive, because they work so well for you. The reward, the prediction, the pleasure comes that way, that that, that fast, that fast, that fast. So you get hooked to it. Now imagine a cell phone that was like ten times bigger, 
and falls on your foot or you can't lift it up and you don't get the reward from it and you don't appreciate and engage in in in, in your prediction of the success of using it is now lost you actually won't learn it it won't become part of your regular automaticity like people's cell phones are what that means is that our brain thrives on real life experience it thrives on all the visual spatial sensory information that we receive not just through the eyes but through the through through touch through smell through gravity through angulation i mean when why do we lift weights why would you bother even lifting a weight? You're lifting a weight because you, the proprioception, because of the challenging of the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments and things. These are the types of things that a physical therapist understands. And this is something that, that they know is to engage you in all of your five, or some of you may have six senses. I don't know if you've got ESP, but you, all your senses have to be engaged to get maximum. Because when we learn any new skill, Think of it when you're training, you know, your, your, your grandchild is learning to walk you over, you'll visit your grandchild and they're walking around and you, and they're like, they have a successful step and you start clapping and that's great. And you shake their hands and go with them up and, and they feel, hear, sense everything. And here's a tree, all this stuff. It's a complete sensory information, a sensory learning modality. Then it becomes permanent part of their learned motor behaviors. If you just gave that little child a little, oculus that shows you how to walk through the room and it just kind of sat there it's not it's going to be worse than, than those guys on wally you know they're just going to be sitting around their little machines and, and being able not being able to do it so i do believe that there are cognitive games that are good for you when you do sudoku or do these types of things they make you really good at sudoku that's good but they don't necessarily make you good at other things they don't in fact transfer over and in fact we, we've been able to show and a lot, of other, a lot of other people are able to show is that certain cognitive skills that we learn in our motor cognitive world actually transfer to better motor cognitive other skills. And so you'll see that spectrum of skills actually expanding. And so, so that becomes very, very, very important. So um, save your money, just go for a walk in the forest rather than putting on the $1,200 headset. So um it's only three hundred dollars oh it's gone down okay but i don't know i you know do a little bit of everything do everything yeah if that motivates you to go off and do other things go for it but don't don't belittle you, you know the, the 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 real experience it is so so important it's it, it's really that's what our brains evolved to yeah mm -hmm. Sorry. Final question. Um, really, can we do this before four o'clock? We have two minutes. Uh, you <laughs> talked about resilience and we talk about that a lot. We, we call it reserve. So cognitive reserve, strength reserve, et cetera. And you mentioned about the 150 minutes. Is there any upper limit to all of this or you know, is more better so that we continue to build up that resilience and reserve? Yeah, so we think of it as a, as a, as a build up and then a plateau. And so 150 minutes seems to be a really good point where we reach some kind of plateau. I, I for me personally, I, my, my weekly is 300 minutes just because I just, it's just, you know, that's just the way I am. Uh, can you do too much? Yeah, you can do too much that you won't get the benefit from. It's sort of like, like, you know, going out for sushi. You can get a lot of benefit from one sushi roll and you're going to be fed, you're going to be happy, you're going to be pleasant, this is going to be a nice experience. I had my one sushi roll. Do I need two sushi rolls? Okay, a little bit more benefit. Three or four sushi rolls, five or six, no more benefit. Okay, if anything, it's going to be detrimental. And in fact, we plateaued. We're no longer hungry, we're no longer in need of this, we're no longer get benefit. That's, you can think of the same type of thing of exercise, that in fact, you get more benefit from the beginning than you do from later. And so the, the zero to 150 minutes is the most benefit. And then we begin to plateau or get less of those types of benefits in terms of cognition. Some people may love to do six hours, you know, 300 minute, minutes a week, go for it. You know, marathon a day, go for it. But that may be detrimental because you may end up hurting something else. So don't have to do. But we do know that 30 minutes a day is a really, really good number. And the data seems to indicate that. So the data drives the decision and the data says 30 minutes a day, that's it. You've got 24 hours a day, 
you've got 48 pieces of 30 minutes, you should be able to fit something in. And it doesn't matter what that is. You don't need an expensive piece of equipment. Uh, you could do almost anything as long as it reaches that intensity where you're in fact not able to talk and ramble like I am now. I'd have to actually stop for breath. Okay, so that so right now I, I the last 40 yeah 60 minutes I have oh my gosh more than 90 whatever it's been I have not been exercising vigorously so I because I've been able to talk but when I do exercise and I'm, and I'm trail running like I did yesterday with my son. I could barely get a word in, okay? So I must've been vigorous to moderate. And that's what you join. And a little bit of sweat, okay? That's what you want to look for. Thank you so much. Very simple. We, we know how busy you are oh and we gosh. really appreciate you it. Appreciate it. There's never too busy for you guys. Yeah. They're sweet. They're, in the chats, everyone's saying how you're great. Just as good as Giselle's. Uh, right. Maybe you don't want to tell her that. Maybe you do. No, no she's the best. She's the, she's the boss. So. You can see how many... <laughs> views you get. And, yes, and hers, this is wonderful. But, you know. So in, in your slide, I mean, this is the way you explained everything and answered our questions. Uh, very understandable and and, um, and and wonderful. So thank you so much for being here. We would definitely want to have you back on to talk Absolutely. about diet and nutrition. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of our studies and Giselle's really on top of that. And she's into the lifestyle. She's into community. She's into underrepresented populations. She's doing all this stuff. And then she's working with the the rats and mice too so a little everything so, yes great yeah. well and for those of you who don't know who we are thank you uh, i'm steph that's lisa and we're pd connect we're a nonprofit in the san francisco bay area but virtually wherever you are you can join us uh, monday through friday for virtual exercise or in person wherever we are take a look at our website uh, it'll be listed right after this thanks so much for joining us Thank you for being here and supporting us in whatever we do, and especially for being a part of our speaker series. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Many grants to come. Yes. Thank you so absolutely. Much. Okay. Thank All right. you. I'll see you guys soon. Okay. Right. If there's anything you need, if you you if you want slides or you want uh, some papers, just ju just drop me an email and 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 we'll get some stuff up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, afternoon. guys. Thank okay. you. Go for go for a trail walk. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.